In essence, um, I want to flag that this is a collaboration that involves uh, myself and then CSIRO with at least three different areas there. So Ocean Atmospheres and the AIM FSP, uh, as well as Data61. Um, there's a role that QUT are playing too, particularly with respect to, to the uh, some of the ML you'll hear about. Uh, but there's also some collaborations which are just starting to commence around the edges of that as well. One of which you'll hear about towards the tail end of the talk. Um, so uh, I'm gonna, as I said, talk a little bit about the platform, Russ then about COT surveys and results, and I'm gonna look, look forward from there. This whole thing really started about uh, three and a bit years ago now when the current round of Crown of Thorns uh, control team work was being bid. And I got to contemplating um, how to replace the old school sort of uh, Mandato technique, uh, which is, yeah, is, goes back to Cheshire in 69 and the, the uh, Crown of Thorns uh, you know, workshops and surveys. But in essence, it's a broad scale survey technique that's that we're going to be talking about here today. It's really not much more than that. But I want to start by saying that uh, one of my passions is I'm a pilot. I fly airplanes. I uh, The glider in the center of the screen there is a, a Schleicher ASW-19. And if you are doing your um, pixel transformations in your head very well, you'll realize that that's the glider that's in the logo. Um, but the point I want to make is this, that gliders kind of represent the pinnacle of efficiency of flight. They, they have to, otherwise you hit the dirt a little bit too quickly. They can fly extremely, they must have a timer on here. They must, extremely a long, high, fast, all the rest of it. But this is because they are very efficient in their flight control surfaces. And they are a proper airplane using ailerons and rudders and elevators and flaps. Um, when you contrast that with the kinds of things that we put in the water, some of them are more appropriately called a brick on a string. Um, and even the ones which are closest in underwater flight rarely use this combination of wings and ailerons and rudders and elevators. And Vertigo 3 has been very, very deliberately designed to mimic true flight underwater. So again, wings, ailerons, elevators, rudders very, very low drag. And when I say that, I'm talking about uh, when it's being towed in an operational sense, relatively shallow, total drag forces of the glider are less than one kilogram. Uh, this, of course, means that you don't need a big boat and, and all the rest of it. It also means you can pull them very fast without them putting a lot of drag on. And for a bunch of reasons, it's also very, very maneuverable, but largely autonomous, so that a pilot can sit there and make some control inputs. Uh, I want, to, I want to address this thing of being tied to the boat by a rope, which is a little unusual in some of the underwater stuff. People tend to think that autonomous is sexy. But as soon as you go underwater, of course, you've lost your ability for GPS loca uh, spatial location. Um, bandwidth is down to almost nothing. And you have to consume 90 odd percent of your uh, energy requirements for moving your underwater body through the water. If you can sort of do away with those things by using a cable, then um, you can become small and therefore agile and fast. Um, it's a robotic vision-based system. So it's got a five megapixel camera in it very, very deliberately with a um, oblique downwards view and very deliberately using video at 15 frames per second. That's not a special number, but the point is, it has to be a fast enough frame rate to enable the benefit of tracking objects through a video field. Um, the human eye is great, of course, um, and very, very good in that central one degree or so, around a, a pretty good out to about six degrees. But beyond that, we have to turn our head uh, and scan the horizon or scan uh, our setting to be able to see in that amount of detail. Uh, of course, a robotic vision thing can do it across the entire field of view the entire time. The thing about the oblique camera view is it allows us to see morphology in the far field as well as vertical views and extents and percentage covers, et cetera, in the down view portion of the same image plane. It also allows us to do funky things like seeing behind a bommie as the glider flies over it, even without 
the glider going nose down over a bombing, we actually get, for a brief few frames, a view of the back edge of that bombing. And I guess I wanted to just sort of say that uh, the task of doing vertical projected um, ML would be kind of analogous to saying, let's do facial rec for people from a camera in the sky that can only see the tops of their head. Um, so accepting that morphology is quite important to us, the whole um, oblique view thing is quite important. Now, this is a standard view from the glider, kind of gets chucked in the water, uh, boat moves off um, very much like a mantato. The image you see right now, though, is the panoramic view subsetted down to the vertical portion of that screen. So you can see there that even though we're dealing with a relatively small part of that screen, um, we've got quite a bit of uh, our, our frame real estate, our, uh, our image frame real estate in that vertical down thing, which kind of is, is what, as scientists, we tend to use for percentage cover estimates and things like that. Um, I'm going to hand over to Russ in just a sec to talk about this, but but clearly the project arose out of a need to think about uh, becoming efficient with crown of thorns, um, culling efforts. Um, and uh, I, Russ was one of the very first guys I reached out to to bounce the idea off. Um, Russ, you're unmuted there. So I think over to you. Okay, thanks, Brett. Yeah, and uh, and I just want to say to everybody that um, you know it's been great to be part of this work, working with uh, you know a guy with the imagination uh, that Brett has got, and also with uh, Bruno Cousy's team from the AMFSP who can bring to bear a lot of those uh, kind of uh, technological and computing skills and, uh, and that sort of background. Uh, I think it's coming together really well. And that's important because um, we need to be as efficient as we can with trying to control the crown of thorns starfish. It's a huge job um, because the GBR is huge, but also it's difficult in its own right. Uh, they're tricky animals to spot and find and kill. So, um, you know, doing it effectively is important. And a lot of progress has been made in that area by incorporating pre-cull surveys as part of the integrated pest management program, but they uh, rely on um, people in the water that takes time and it takes people away from doing the diver control stuff. So um, as much fun as manta towing may be, and you can see a couple of people um, manta towing into jaws there in image number three, um, it's not potentially the most time effective way of doing it. And there, you know, this glider, I think, really represents a step forward in that effort. So next breath. Uh, and here's an example of um, just what it can do. So uh, in July, uh, our team went up to Capricorn Bunker Group, based out of Heron Island, and we did some manta toes around Fitzroy Reef, um, Llewellyn Reef, and part of Lamont in the time that we had there. So. Uh, you can see the perimeter that we towed of Fitzroy. We also did Fitzroy Shoal, which is a kind of extension of the reef that's around 20 to 25 meters deep off of there below diver depths and below Manitou depths in most cases. Um, so we covered you know, many kilometers of reef there and accumulated a lot of images. Went through those images uh, one by one, mostly Brett and I putting these red boxes around all the starfish that we could see. So there's a hell of a lot of data there. You know, high resolution uh, images are pretty high anyway these days. So every 66 milliseconds or 15 times a second, we're picking up these starfish. And in this image, which has been just picked out, um, there are four starfish. So you might see two of them pretty much immediately. It takes a bit more work to find the other two. So um, here they all are. And um, you know, this kind of comparison between the previous image and this one just highlights um, one of the uh, benefits of using uh, computers and machine learning to identify these things. So this image is a lot brighter and the starfish are clearer because we've tweaked the brightness and contrast. 
computers don't need to do that. All the information is there and they can still pull it out without any of that fiddling around. So just one example of how this can streamline the process. Uh, next. So this is the kind of thing that we found. So here's uh, Fitzroy Reef. And in June, the COTS control team went to this reef to conduct control culling operations. And before they did that, they did what they usually do, which is tow around the perimeter of the reef and find where the starfish are so that they can target their operations. And each of those red dots represents a crown of thorns or a sector of reef, a two minute manitou where a crown of thorns was seen. And on the right, it's the same data from our tow. And uh, you can see that there's a pretty close correspondence between the data from the manta toe and the data from the glider. And next, just boring down into that result a bit more <clears throat> and contrasting them. Um, one of the differences between the uh, two types of data is that the manta toe um, kind of unit of resolution is about a 200 meter long stretch of reef. So you know, that's where the data is reported from. Uh, toe is about three knots and the divers relate back this information to someone in the boat recording coral cover, live and dead, um, number of starfish, their size, number of feeding scars and so on. So with the glider, by contrast, we have a wider and potentially deeper track depending on where you choose to tow it, but it can go deeper than the Manitou divers. There are more data points because you get a data point uh, 15 per second, in fact, that can be interrogated. And, uh, and that really gives you kind of qualitatively different results as, uh, as can be illustrated by one of these outputs from the images. If we go to the next one. Um, so there's on average 1200 images per 200 meters. We're towing faster. And we get a lot of information, um, not only about what the machine is doing, <clears throat> but also geolocation, far more precise and accurate location of the starfish. Um, we get environmental data that corresponds to each of those points. Uh, we've got an image of everything that can, we can go back and interrogate later. And we can use machine learning to pull information out of those things once it's been trained. But just to contrast the results again, the blue is the manta toe data from June and the uh, glider vertigo three data in July, less than a month later. So it's very similar. And um, in fact, despite the control operations, we found more starfish in July than we did in June. So I guess um, highlights why we need to keep going back to these reefs until the starfish are controlled. Just thinking about the relative uh, efficiency and the amount of information that these methods can provide. The Mandato saw 25 starfish. Uh, Brett and I going through all of those images painstakingly uh, found 50. Okay, so twice as many. Uh, it took a lot of time to go through those images, but when we applied machine learning to those images, we found uh, even more starfish. And that analysis can be done in, in a matter of uh, a few minutes. So uh, it's about 40% more starfish that were found with machine learning. And all of those have been uh, you know, checked by humans and, and we agree that the machine was correct in classifying them that way. We did actually do an additional tow in a slightly deeper transect on the sort of northwest corner of the reef on another day and an additional 30 or so starfish were found there in a, a little bit deeper water. So it's even higher density than, uh, you know, it might appear at first glance. And it just illustrates the flexibility of the system to go into habitats where regular manta tow might not be feasible. Okay, Brian. Uh, so, so I'll just sort of quickly run you through this. There's a starfish sitting right on a bit of nice plate coral and it's, uh, it's very obvious um, the kind of thing you see. 
but there's a funny couple of things about the way the human brain and eye works and that is you're drawn away from other other objects in the same frame the other thing is sometimes these things happen so fast that you you can't see them now i don't know how many of you saw it there i'll slow it down try it again slowly there's the starfish on the right hand side right there middle of the screen it was visible for around about six frames so that's uh, less than half a second um we're we're frequently finding crown of thorns that are only visible for less than one second this graph basically has the duration of visibility across the bottom of the screen um, and since we're doing 15 frames per second anything below here is visible for less than one second now we have found starfish which are visible only for a single frame in other words there was only a 66 millisecond window of time in which that starfish was able to be seen and and they were seen um, but the point here is that um, a great majority of these starfish um, would only be seen by a human observer if you happen to be looking at the right spot uh, in the in your field of view at that time um, the the this kind of 40 percent of starfish should have uh, you know visible for less than one second type of thing is actually uh, you know history will tell whether it's a coincidence or not but it is uncannily like the amount that um, Russ and I missed when we were annotating all of our all of our video footage it's uh, you know, if the ML can do that and hit 40% more than an observer taking a lot of time to do it, then there's a great potential for, for that ML to, um, in the longer term and over many, many sites, take over from where humans are, are you know, doing their observations and struggling with all of the things about concentration and scan rate and tiredness and things like that. Um, very early on our first model began to find starfish that we had missed and it's quite interesting the process by which that happens there's the starfish down there don't know how many of you saw it in that frame in reality the computer missed it in this frame here detected it here detected it here missed missed and detected again and this highlights one of the really nice things about using oblique fast frame video in that we can build algorithms now which don't rely on a single detection but rely on the pattern of a sequence of detections. In this case, the starfish was only visible clearly to the, to the ML for three frames in a five frame sequence over around about one third of a second. Now, when I first looked at that sequence, I wasn't even particularly convinced. I had to, to zoom in hugely until I realized that what I was looking at was a piece of coral here with the starfish um, partially covered by it. And then I started ticking off the characteristic features. So it's around about the right size range. It, it looks round when it's on a flat surface, the central disc about 50% of total diameter many individual arms and you can you can see some of them here and around here over here and here um, the the coloration pattern and the final giveaway was when you zoom in adequately you can actually see the spines on the edge of the arm so russ and i both reviewed this and went wow um, it's the ml is starting to work russ over to you okay um so <clears throat> one of the um more recent developments in terms of the data that's been possible to uh, be derived from the, these images is uh, size of starfish. So that offers the potential to get some insights or, for, you know, some quite detailed insights, in fact, into the dynamics of starfish populations on individual reefs and, you know, across, uh, you know, many reefs that are surveyed on the GBR. So uh, these size estimates were you know, fairly crudely derived as a first pass by looking at the, uh, the dimensions of the box that delimits 
starfish in those frames. Um, the, each frame is slightly different. So a median size was derived from that. And here you've got the size distribution of the population of starfish that were found at Llewellyn Reef. And uh, although the sample size is not huge, it's a, uh, you know, 100 or more starfish. And it looks like there are several cohorts there of uh, one-year-old, two-year-old, possibly three and plus in a year class starfish and, and some that are even older. So it's, uh, it's quite evident that this outbreak on Llewellyn is not the result of a single pulse of larvae coming from some distant reef. Rather, it's been, you know, potentially multiple recruitments that have uh, resulted in the population that we see there. So, um, you know, that's something that's been a bit of a question, an ongoing question in terms of understanding outbreaks. So just one demonstration of the type of information that can come out of this. And it's also information that's useful to control teams. So, um, you know, they're more likely to see the bigger starfish, of course, because the behavior of the smaller ones uh, makes them harder to find. They're more cryptic. And that gives an insight into, um, you know, what kind of time, length of time, the amount of revisitation might be required to uh, completely control the starfish on that reef. Okay. Um, other information that can come from the glider data, and this is really important, is uh, information on coral cover or the benthic uh, community structure on reefs. So, of course, we're not killing cranothorns just for the sake of it. We're trying to control them so that we can protect the corals on the Great Barrier Reef. And in order to do that effectively and to uh, demonstrate that effectiveness, we have to have good data on coral cover and composition. So the glider data obviously presents an opportunity to get uh, a much better picture of coral right around the reef, um, being able to do away with small snapshots of coral cover and having to extrapolate to the rest of the habitats around the reef. So um, I guess the task is to try to automate that so that the data on coral cover can be pulled out at the same time as we're getting the data on the crown of thorns. So matching up the starfish, the amount of coral, where the control effort is, really getting a picture of how everything is tracking in terms of the control efforts. So um, this is one kind of approach that's been applied using segmentation. I think Brett can talk you through exactly what you're gonna see next in this video. So this is a, a short video from the, uh, it's actually from the back of Lamont Reef. Um, every 15 centimetres of forward motion, there's a new frame and the frame is analysed in its entirety for um, five or six classes of habitat there. Uh, you'll notice that in the far field of the image where it's a little bit murkier and uh, a lot uh, shallower declination angles on, on the vision, that it's uh, consistently getting things a little wrong, but as the glider moves closer, gets better visual um, you know, acuity in terms of its on-ground pixel size and that, and starts to get that uh, you know view coming into the vertical projection, things are a lot more um, consistent. Um, we're in the process at the moment of refining uh, a region of interest and um, and defining that uh, properly, optimizing it and then um, be able to produce habitat estimates every 15 centimetres forward, the question will then become one of how do we aggregate that information at a useful management scale? And, and uh, just to sort of put it out there, RIS surveys tend to be done uh, within sort of five metres of, of an observer, which implies about a 10 metre spatial scale. So perhaps we aggregate this stuff up at a, at a 10 metre spatial scale, but certainly it was obvious while we were in the boat and watching the live feed that um, things like uh, areas um, which have recently been killed by crown of thorn starfish you know, were an abrupt transition to higher coral cover or 
you would anticipate um, yeah, issues when the coral cover started to decrease and dead coral started to increase. All of these things are now sort of available at quite a fine granular scale. Yeah, and if I could just butt in there, it was, uh, you know, it was really in, um, instructive to go around those reefs, looking at the video in the boat as it was collected and see just how the coral cover and coral composition changed systematically around the whole reef. It's, uh, you know, it's not just that you happen to look at one patch and it's different over here than it is over there. You really begin to get insights into how reef orientation and other factors um, play out with types of coral that are there and potential food resource for starfish um, and so forth. So there's a lot of applications of this data once it starts to come online. So where, where are we at and, and what are we doing going forward? So with respect to the standard uh, things collected in COTS mandatowing, um, we already have things working usefully enough that when we go back into the field, some of these will, will be embedded. Every one of them needs more annotations, um, in particular to deal with the, the subject of, of generalization from one environment to another, et cetera, one type of reef to another. Uh, and then optimization, validation, and, and some uh, quite detailed work to both uh, validate and characterize the glider's performance and particularly performance relative to other uh, Mandatow and diver search techniques. Also to look at whether those characterizations are then habitat specific um, and look at repeatability of the method, etc. cetera. Um, with respect to SCARs, there's some um, the training sets already developed and uh, there's a few more annotations needed and then we will start to characterize those models, but we're a little way from that yet. Um, and number five, visibility is a, an interesting one. We've, we've put it on the back burner, um, not because it's technically challenging, in fact, probably the opposite. Understanding that manta toes are about trying to estimate density of starfish on a per square meter or a hectare basis. Uh, obviously, underwater visibility and its limitations is something that um, should be factored into regularly to these methods. Um, they tend not to be with a lot of manta toe work, uh, but particularly using some fairly standard computer vision methods, we're able to work out the, you know, the depth of our field of view from the glider and, and how that changes as you go around a reef or through a patch of runoff you know, from a lagoon or something like that. So, so we're certainly going to focus in the um, foreseeable future on um, getting the standard a crown of thorns survey uh, variables down pat on the glider. But then of course, there's a whole bunch of other interesting things that we want to start to push into, which we think that there's a strong management imperative for. Within a frame, we can see relationships, spatial relationships, distances and clustering, et cetera, between starfish and uh, feeding scars. Uh, then we can start to pull together uh, information across multiple frames, whether that's, for example, mapping as well as size distributions to work out recruitment patterns, um, looking at habitat types versus size uh, to, to look at whether there are uh, growth or uh, habitat specific uh, growth rates or size distributions. And also taking the mapping outputs and the habitat outputs and starting to improve metrics on just how much of an impacted reef has been lost or is recovering. I think there's the, the nice thing about this data set is absolutely everything that comes off the glider is archived. And so we have a very interesting ability to go back and revisit old data and ask new questions of old data that's, uh, that's something that's a bit hard to do with most of the other survey techniques. 
The other area that's quite fascinating with the glider from a from a what we observe in the field sense is the way it seems to open up some new opportunities for fish surveys. Everybody knows that as you're trying to count fish, the little ones disappear and uh, and the big ones come in and say hello. And, and that leads to biases and it takes a lot of expertise and care to, to try and minimise those. We also know that when we do things like chuck a quadrant on the coral for a photo, uh, that that scares away the fish in its own right. And therefore it's very hard to characterise fish in these surveys, even though fish might be one of the best indicators there are around of, of reef health and recovery and things like that. So uh, the glider's oblique view then allows us to uh, see the fish before they start to hide in the coral, but also the glider at a total wingspan of about uh, 760 millimetres. Uh, it weighs less than six kilograms. Uh, it has a tiny frontal profile and it's not very scary to fish. And, and so if you were to look at the way these clouds of small fish ordinarily behave when a diver's moving through the water or a mantatoa, uh, and then look at the video footage, you're, su you're struck by how little the fish react to the glider. Um, we also have uh, techniques that allow us to perform calculations based on things like uh, movement of pixels within images that allow us to do things like this, where we highlight the movement of fish uh, in, a, in a moving video. And we're finding fish which are absolutely not obvious to a hum human observer who might be reviewing that footage. The uses of that, of course, are that it gives us a, a um, jump start on things like um, identifying and counting fish and segmenting them for further analysis. Um, but it also uh, uh, leads into an area where we're using that optical flow to identify obstacles that improve the glider's flight path planning ability. But I want to point out one example, and this is um, uh, Abedefdaf and, uh, and a sequence of video frames. There's only five frames there, but those frames represent around about 1.3 seconds worth of video footage. Um, I have manually labelled those, um, uh, each of the Abedef stuff in there to, uh, as part of our, our training set. And we find that in the first, you know, real observation of the fish as you approach this particular bommie, there were 45 and then, um, you know, a few uh, milliseconds later, uh, 49 and then 44. But by the time we get to uh, one second uh, from the first frame, the fish are starting to disappear into the coral. And by the time the glider is approaching over the top of them, two thirds of them have, have hidden. For a human observer, it would be almost impossible to do anything other than a, uh, an estimate to the nearest dozen or, or hundred. But uh, with the ML capacity uh, that we have aboard the, the surface computer, there's no reason why the glider can't be counting the number of fish in every frame. And I think that opens up some really interesting ways to characterize biomass and diversity other than the types of things that we commonly look at um, on the seabed habitat you know, classes. And there's another area which, um, which is um, I don't want to describe it as blue sky because, in fact, there's a lot about this which is very old, just hasn't been applied yet. But imagine a system where we were able to look at risk to downstream reefs from the breeding potential of the starfish which we're observing at this point in time. So live, you know, live 3D modelling being conducted from the glider while it's making identifications of starfish and attaching uh, risk to starfish on an individual or cluster basis. Um, both risk to, well, certainly risk to the downstream uh, reefs, uh, but also flipping the question around and looking at 
uh, where have the starfish originated from? So the forecast question, should we cull these ones or those ones if it meant a different outcome for high priority reefs in the downstream area? Or uh, asking the question, wow, we're seeing a lot of starfish here and yet we, what, we're, we're not really sure where these ones came from. What does the computer say? Now, the thing about this is within industry, particle tracking models have been around for a long, long time. They're, they're always used when uh, some oil has been discharged from a ship and people need to backtrack to see which ship it might have been um, or for spill predictions for finding marine pests, where have they come from and where are they likely to propagate to uh, in the event of a loss of a person or a, or a vessel. Um, Queensland Water Police, for example, have been using these models for 11 years in an operational sense to uh, every time the, you know, someone's lost at sea. Uh, and so there are, there are plenty of people around who provide operational modelling capability to support these kind of initiatives. And, and uh, one of these emerging collaborations uh, is with a group that's based here in Queensland that, that does this consistently. And, um, and they've already done some work with me to look at how they integrate that in the spare CPU capacity of the glider uh, and make the results available live to people who are involved with decision-making processes. And for example, um, they've recently run uh, fine scale 3D hydrodynamic models of particles tracked from for example, this little um, box up there around between Hastings and Michaelmas and Arlington Reef. Um, in this case, the same model's been run with source points in each of those. And in each case here, we're talking about a two hour spawning event, um, you know, based on what we know of the starfish ecology and when they spawn and where they spawn in the water column, et cetera. And looking at, at um, a couple of specific release points on each of those reefs and where the uh, high probability recruitment events are likely to occur. And you can see that, for example, um, and sorry, I didn't put many reef names on here, but uh, Britomar uh, seems to you know, be a favoured spot for uh, where uh, recruits could end up from a Hastings reef, a reef release. But if the starfish happen to be more prolific on Arlington, then you can see that um, Britomar cops far fewer and the great majority of recruits would end up uh, a little further south um, around about the Bowl Reef and, uh, and through, a back, through to the back numbers area off Townsville. So uh, this, this, um, this is just, I guess for us, this sounds almost bizarre or, uh, or very, very strange that this kind of modeling could even be done in a live sense and looking at clusters of starfish or, or even individual starfish. Um, but in fact, the technology is quite old and there are people who are quite, quite uh, skilled and experienced in this already. And, and we've already worked out the the model schema and uh, and data management schemas that would allow this to be updated for example with live east australian current and weather information forecast information so that at any given time the information is available and and i raise this because you know well obviously because it's actually possible and uh, and and maybe even implementable in the near term but more in the sense that uh our ability to to uh, to ask questions of of our environment is uh, depends entirely on what kind of uh, tools and metrics we have, and I think in that sense, um, this sort of fast glider with high computational power aboard opens up an enormous amount of possibilities that we really haven't thought too much about yet. Um, and, and for example, we don't, at this point in time, our, our control strategies are about saving coral through direct predation. Um, but in the future, it's entirely possible to see that at a certain time of year, you might actually change that strategy over to 
protecting the, you know, preventing the next version of an outbreak by targeting, in this case, for example, um, you know, not Hastings or Michaelmas this morning, but Arlington, because we know that we're approaching spawning and the higher priority reefs are somewhere else. So some interesting kind of possibilities there. Uh, and I'm certainly, I want to actually reach out to anybody who's, um, uh, you know, found interest in this presentation and say that uh, as we advance the tech further, we will be only ever dealing with a small fraction of its capabilities ourselves. And we will be inviting collaborations and, and uh, joint ventures with other parties to expand upon capability in the system and to demonstrate different use cases, et cetera. The other thing I wanted to say is, thank heavens it's all archived because um, anybody who wants to now go back and mine the data for sharks or sea snakes or uh, squid, coral trout, spider shells, uh, giant clams, uh, other types of starfish and, and, and any other um, things that can be seen in the video uh, can go back and develop models and, uh, you know, identify things and map them. And, and as the data set builds over time, imagine the resource in a decade when, when all of these things can be mined back out of old data sets. Um, so I just want to kind of wrap up and say um, around about three years now of quite solid progress seems to be a very good potential. It's, uh, it's already, uh, you know, we took five units up to Heron Island last July, um, only needed to put two in the water. Um, we've spent a lot of time since then optimizing the design for moving it towards manufacture. Um, we're a little ways to go yet, but it is certainly conceivable that within the next year or two, we will have um, uh, multiple units able to be used by, yeah, under the supervision of this team because they're still a little bit fragile. Uh, and, uh, you know, unless you happen to know a Linux command line interface, it's, uh, you'll struggle to use it. But within the next year or so, we fully expect to be able to start rolling out gliders to people in either teams or other research capacities to operate them without a robotic specialist uh, or, a, or a Linux command line specialist uh, within your team. Um, some aspects of the skill sets of the gliders are, are deployable now and some of that's being embedded ready for the next round of field work. Um, we're uh, we're going to focus a lot ourselves, and uh, and we're hoping, of course, that you know there'll be support for optimizing and validation of the technique, and especially into method comparisons and characterizations of of where and when it works, and where you know where it might be uh, needing more work. And I think I want to want to say that what we really see here is let's start with good, and and good means you know we we might just uh, for example be able to provide data on the crown of thorns uh, use case with, for example, the standard mandato uh, variables and extend that to great with some of these other uh, very, very interesting superpowers later on. Um, I'm going to stop screen sharing now. Russ, did you want to say anything else while I do that? And Um, no, I think I might just uh, wait for any questions and uh, and see what comes up there. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, Russ.